Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture which will be on photosynthesis. Just a reminder, after each of the slides there will be a chalkboard notes review slide so that you can pause and write down the notes that would have been placed on the chalkboard for the previous slide. So when we talk about photosynthesis, the first thing I want to draw your attention to is the formula for photosynthesis. So we have it written out right here. Plants take in carbon dioxide that we breathe out and with the use of water and solar power, so light from the sun, they are then able to produce sugar and release the product of oxygen, which I don't know about you, but I think oxygen is kind of important for us. Now, when we think about where this is occurring, you're going to notice the chloroplast over here. And in later slides, we will focus on the individual portions, exactly where certain stages are happening, such as thylakoids or stroma. Uh, but for now, the main emphasis is that uh, photosynthesis is taking place in the chloroplast, as opposed to what we discussed previously about the electron transport chain and respiration, which occurs in the mitochondria. So now when we think about photosynthesis, I want you to break it down into two reactions, okay? So you have the light reactions and you have the dark reactions, which are also called the Calvin cycle. Okay, and just as the name suggests, the light reactions, you notice they will require sunlight, whereas the dark reactions will not. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the main purpose when we look at these things, and we're going to keep reemphasizing this in later slides, is that in the light reactions, you are going to have the oxidation of water to produce oxygen. Whereas the dark reactions, their focus is going to be to produce sugars by the fixation of carbon dioxide. Okay, so since we saw in this formula that you have two different things occurring, you have the fixation of carbon dioxide to produce sugar, that portion will be here in the Calvin cycle. So you see carbon dioxide going into the Calvin cycle. You see sugar coming out here. And then you have the other event occurring. You have water on this side getting oxidized, and then ultimately you are going to have oxygen produced in this area. And again, we're going to repeat some of this in the later slides to really solidify it into uh, your memory. Okay, so as I mentioned a moment ago, I want you to think of photosynthesis based on two sets of reactions. So always think, okay, we have the light reactions and we have the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle. For the light reactions, just like the title suggests, light meaning they require sunlight. So these reactions will only occur when sunlight is available, meaning during the daytime. Now, the reason that is, is that these are the energy capturing reactions that that's going to energize the electrons. Basically, the solar energy converts to chemical energy, which will be in the form of ATP, which we've mentioned a lot of times previously, and NADPH. OK, now you will see when we go over the light reactions that ener the, the energized electrons will be moving down an electron transport chain. And as we saw in previous uh, lectures, you know, that's that's going to be a good way to ultimately lead toward energy production. Then we have the Calvin cycle and the Calvin cycle uh, reactions. These are called the dark reactions because they are occurring after the light reactions and they're not going to require sunlight. OK, so whereas uh, the, the first light reactions are for a conversion of solar energy, these dark reactions will convert the chemical energy products of the light reactions, meaning the ATP and the NADPH that we just mentioned. These reactions will convert those ATP and NADPH to a different form of chemical energy, 
which is in the form of carbohydrates, meaning the sugar that we mentioned would be produced in the, in the Calvin cycle. Okay, and ultimately it's going to involve the uh, reduction or, or fixation of carbon dioxide to ultimately get that sugar. And that, you know, brings us again to the kind of figure that we saw in the first slide where you have carbon dioxide going into the Calvin cycle. And then you notice you end up with the sugar product at the end. So now at the beginning of this lecture, we mentioned that chloroplasts are the organelle sites of photosynthesis in green plants. And as you can see from this figure, the chloroplast is actually made up of a bunch of different parts. So the first part that I want to point out here is the granum, or you'll hear individually, um, so sorry, in the plural form, grana. And when you look at this, the grana is basically the bodies within the chloroplast that will have the thylakoid discs. And the thylakoid discs are those individual discs that you see stacked on top of each other. And they're very important because as we mentioned earlier, the thylakoid discs are the actual site for the light reactions, okay? So I want you to circle star highlight thylakoid in your notes on the next slide when we have the chalkboard notes because the thylakoid discs are very important for the light reactions. Then you'll notice that the space between the thylakoid discs will be the thylakoid space. And then the other term that I want you to circle star highlight in your notes is the stroma. And the stroma we mentioned uh, already that that is going to be the site of the Calvin cycle or the dark reactions. So light reactions are in the thylakoid discs. The stroma is where the Calvin cycle will occur. And it's very important because the stroma is basically the equivalent to the mitochondrial matrix that we talked about in previous uh, lectures. And when I say that it's the site of the Calvin cycle or the dark reactions, it means that it's where you're going to have the production of the carbohydrate or the, the sugar during photosynthesis. So when we focus on carbon dioxide getting fixed into carbohydrate or sugar, that is occurring in the stroma. Okay, so make sure you, you remember the thylakoid discs and the stroma as the two most important structures on the list that we just talked about. Okay, so I love this slide. Well, then again, technically I love all the slides I make because they're amazing. But anyway, uh, what I love about this slide is that when we take a look at the structure on this slide, the chlorophyll structure shown here, it should look very similar to you to some things that we talked about in the past already. So when you take a look at this and you see this structure with the little metal ion inside, it should remind you of when we looked at the heme of myoglobin, hemoglobin, and the cytochromes that we talked about just previously uh, in the recent lectures. Now, what you'll notice is that when we talked about heme of myoglobin, hemoglobin, and cytochromes, in the center, we had the little iron ion. But now, what do you notice what's bound instead of iron? Here we have magnesium, okay, magnesium. And it's important that we have any kind of metal ion in here because that will be what's called a cofactor. So when you think of cofactor versus coenzyme, that terminology for cofactor, I always tell students to think of factories and picture a factory with the bricks and the, the big smoke coming out. And that'll remind you of inorganic matter because cofactors are metals or minerals that will then help activate enzymes. So if you think of like a steel workers factory, you're thinking of metal. Okay, that will remind you cofactors are metals or minerals. Whereas coenzymes, those are organic matter that help to activate enzymes and they are in the form of vitamins. Okay, now getting back to this particular slide. So that takes care of the first questions that I have up here. The next questions that I have 
is what are accessory pigments? And whenever you hear that term, I just want you to think of plant pigments that are not chlorophyll that play a role in photosynthesis. Okay, so the role, the roles that we have in photosynthesis, we're going to go more into detail in the next slides and everything. But for now, focus on you have chlorophyll and then you have the accessory pigments or plant pigments that are not chlorophyll, but will still play an important role in photosynthesis. Okay, so now let's get back to what's actually happening in photosynthesis. Remember that when I mentioned photosynthesis early, I said, please keep focusing on it as two types of reactions. You have the light reactions and you have the dark reactions. And we mentioned that in the light reactions, you're going to have water being converted to oxygen by oxidation. And you're also going to have NADP plus getting reduced to NADPH. And so when you look at the figure here, you see those two things that we mentioned earlier getting represented in two parts of the figure. So over here, you see the oxidation of water to oxygen. And over here, you see NADP plus getting reduced to NADPH. Okay, and ultimately this redox where you have oxidation and reduction occurring is coupled to the phosphorylation of ADP, which will produce ATP, so synthesis of ATP. And because this is a light reaction and you have solar power going into the systems leading to this ATP production uh, and that phosphorylation of AD, ADP to produce ATP, uh, we call that photophosphorylation. Okay, because it's the phosphorylation that is light dependent. Now, when we talk about the, the two processes occurring in the light reaction, the oxidation here and the reduction up here, so the production of oxygen and the production of NADPH, uh, they are accomplished by two different photosystems. So you see these photosystems embedded in the thylakoid membrane. And so you have Photosystem 2 over here, which will be uh, responsible for the, the, uh, sorry, the oxidation of water that you see here. And then you have Photosystem 1 over here that's responsible for the reduction of NADP+. Now, I know it's a little confusing that you see that Photosystem 2 is occurring before Photosystem 1, and you're like, okay, I'm not an expert in math, but I'm pretty sure 1 usually becomes you know, comes before two. The reason why it's in this order is because photosystem uh, one over here was actually discovered first. So when they discover and they, they isolate uh, any kind of structure, you know, you're going to name it one. But it turns out that when you're looking at this process, you're actually starting with photosystem two for the, uh, for the oxidation of water to oxygen. And then Next comes photosystem one, which is responsible for, again, the reduction of NADP plus to NADPH. And then over here, just remember, you also have the production of ATP, okay, because that's an important part of, of the light reactions. And then we mentioned earlier that the products from these light reactions, the products of ATP, for instance, and NADPH, those then go into the dark reactions to provide the energy and the reducing power for the fixation of carbon dioxide to then make the sugar because we said that's the point of the next stage of the of the dark reactions okay Now, before we go into the details of the dark reactions, I just want to take a moment to zoom in on photosystem two and then photosystem one to go over a few extra details about each of those. So with photosystem two, just a reminder, again, that's the one, even though it's called two, that will be the one that's accomplishing the first goal, which is the oxidation of water and, and the production of oxygen. And that's going to be accomplished by what's called the oxygen evolving complex. 
uh, that will basically pass through a series of different oxidation states in the transfer of electrons to, to ultimately accomplish the goal of oxidation of water. But you don't have to worry about those details. Just focus on how photosystem 2, what's happening is the oxidation of water to oxygen. Now, with this, this uh, photosystem, you're going to have various electron acceptors. And so the first one that you're going to have is called pheophyton. Okay, pheophyton, which is shown over here, uh, type uh, of uh, B-type uh, cytochromes. And then the next electron acceptor, I'm sorry, I should have put them in order in the figures, but it goes from pheophyton to then plastoquinone over here. And then in the electron transport chain portion of the photosystem that you saw, which is responsible ultimately for the production of the ATP, that is the, the protein plastocyanin, also known as PC. And what's important with that one is it is associated with copper, okay? And so you've seen throughout the lesson so far that whenever you have a metal ion, such as copper or, for instance, uh, magnesium or iron, they're very good at binding things, and in some cases it's electrons. So that makes it very useful to have plastocyanin in the electron transport uh, chain portion of the, the photosystem. Okay. That then brings us to photosystem one which comes after photosystem two. I know, again, that's a little confusing. And here, the electron acceptors might look a little bit familiar. So the electron acceptors are chlorophyll A, and sorry, I just got to grab the laser, chlorophyll and ferredoxin. And the reason why I say this may look a little bit familiar to you is that ferredoxin, those are iron sulfur proteins. And so if you think back to when we talked about oxidative phosphorylation and electron transport chains, we saw in some of those complexes, you saw FMN and then a whole bunch of Fe-S. So those were iron sulfur proteins that were great at being carriers to pass electrons along. And so it makes sense that now we're seeing those again as great electron acceptors. And again, anytime you see something like iron or magnesium or, or copper, they're very good at binding things such as electrons to help as carriers and, and, and acceptors and passing things along. Now, something else that will look very familiar to you on this slide is this structure here. Okay, it's cute. It looks like a little hot air balloon, but it also looks very similar to a certain turbine type structure that we also saw in the oxidative phosphorylation lesson. If you remember that you see a proton gradient portion over here through a membrane, and then you see a turbine looking rotational portion here, and that is the ATP synthase that we saw back in the previous lectures where we looked at oxidative phosphorylation. And you see you have the proton gradient going into it, and then you notice you have the production of ATP over here. Okay, so what's occurring in addition to um, the the aspects of the photosystem that we focused on so far is you have the coupling of the production of ATP. So you have an electron transfer, a series of electron transfers, and then you have the coupling to the ATP synthesis over here. So now, as you know, my favorite part of the biochem lessons are the real world connections. Although technically, I guess anytime you look outside and see a plant or even in your house with the house plants, the, you know, that's kind of a real world connection to photosynthesis. But I find it really cool when it relates to things like paraquat. So whenever you see paraquat, I want you to think of a potent herbicide, okay, meaning that it kills plants. And the way that it kills the plants is if we take a look, just got to get the laser pointer. If you take a look at photosystem one, now remember we have photosystem two and then photosystem one. 
Photosystem 1 is responsible for the reduction of NADP plus to NADPH. Okay, and so in with, with Photosystem 1, when you have uh, electrons getting passed along Photosystem 1, they're supposed to get donated to NADP plus to reduce it to NADP, uh, NADPH. But what happens with paraquat is that it accepts the electrons from Photosystem 1 and it will donate them to oxygen instead of NADP plus. Okay, so it's blocking NADPH production. Now, as we've mentioned before, that production of NADPH is critical to the photosynthesis process because the ATP and NADPH then go toward the dark reactions to make the sugar. So without NADPH getting produced, boom, you don't have sugar production. You don't have photosynthesis. The plant will die. It gets killed. Okay. And at the same time, by giving those electrons to oxygen instead of NADP+, it's now creating superoxide, which are uh, basically you can think of them as reactive oxygen species, kind of like uh, when you, you have these, uh, think of it as almost like a mutated form of oxygen, okay? So it's extra reactive, it's going to then want to bind to things that it should not and, and react to things that it should not. And for instance, it can end up creating things that are toxic to the cells. Okay, so kind of picture it going around and leading to hydrogen peroxide production and various other things that should not be happening. Okay, so that is how paraquat ends up being a potent herbicide. It kills plants by blocking NADPH production. Now, when we talk about photosynthesis and we keep mentioning, you know, the idea of it being light dependent for these light reactions, uh, I want to draw your attention to light harvesting complexes and you can circle star highlight them as LHCs. Uh, what these are are proteins that have what's called chromophores and they participate in basically transfer of energy and they are the most abundant proteins that you find all along the thylakoid membrane, okay? And what's important about them, if you picture what their function is, they can capture light energy. So we refer to them as almost like little solar panels, and they are basically like reaction centers that can be very important for uh, capturing and collecting the light energy that has to be used by the photosystems of the, the light reactions. In addition to LHCs, another term I want you to be able to recognize and know the definition of is the Z scheme. And when you look at the Z scheme, so officially what we define it as is a series of photosystems. Okay, and when you look at it though, and you see it over here, okay, what does this look like to you that we have seen before? Okay, when you look at something like this and you see electrons getting passed down what looks like a set of stairs, well, that should remind you of the electron transport system that we saw in oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so when we say the Z scheme, what it is technically is a series of photosystems that will, you know, pass along electrons, but what it's equivalent to is the electron transport chain that we saw back in oxidative phosphorylation. So now the last thing to focus on when we're talking about the light systems before we move on to the dark reactions 
is to look at the coupling to ATP production. Because remember, we said you have photosystem one, you have photosystem two, and you have ATP production uh, in these light reaction parts of the, of the photosynthesis process. Now, the first thing that I want to point out is when you're looking at this figure and you see these protons crossing a membrane and having a differential uh, concentration values, that is reminiscent of the proton gradient that we saw in the mitochondria. Now, what reactions are contributing to this proton gradient in the case of photosynthesis? Well, it's the light reactions. And what's happening in the light reactions? Well, we said oxidation of water, you have the electron transport, and the reduction of NADP+. So if you picture that figure that we had way back in the previous slides of this lecture, then you'll remember seeing photosystem 2 had the oxidation of water, then you had the electron transport in the middle, and then uh, photosystem 1, you had the reduction of NADP+. So those reactions are what's contributing to the proton gradient here. Now, when you look at this figure and you see the protons crossing that thylakoid membrane, well, inside here, that is the thylakoid space, and then out here you have the stroma, okay? And when you look here, you'll notice that you have more or a higher concentration of the hydrogen ions. And so when you have a greater concentration of hydrogen ions, that represents acidity, lower pH. So what's happening to the pH when you have this proton gradient going into that lumen of the thylakoid space, well, it tells you that it's causing the pH of the thylakoid space to become more acidic, so lower than over here, than this side, which is the stroma. Okay, so taking a look at that differential in, in protons, that helps you visualize that over here is going to be a lower pH. Then we get to the dark reactions or the Calvin cycle. And as we've already mentioned before, this is the stage where carbon dioxide fixation is going to lead to the production of carbohydrate. And when we look at this, we've mentioned that this is occurring in the stroma, okay? So the light reactions occurred in the thylakoid and dark reactions are in the stroma. And I want you to circle star highlight the first enzyme here, Rubisco, the reason why I have you do that is a lot of times when we talk about pathways and whatnot, it's always important to know uh, the first enzyme involved because a lot of times this will come back to be very important in terms of regulation of that process. So whenever you hear Rubisco, I want you to think, oh, that's for the Calvin cycle. That's what's going to start off the, the process. Something else I want to point out, when you look at this Calvin cycle and what's occurring here, you'll notice you have ATP getting utilized and you have NADPH getting utilized. And we had mentioned that those two things are products from the light reaction that then provide the energy necessary to have the fixation of carbon dioxide to ultimately produce the uh, carbohydrate or the sugar at the end for the plant. Over here, I like to scare students and make you think that I'm going to have you memorize every single thing in this table. But the point of this is just to show you that even though that last slide kind of made the Calvin cycle figure look kind of simple and not, like not much is going on, uh, this shows you here that it's actually a very complicated uh, process and a lot going on. And when you have the, the Calvin cycle occurring, you also have to have the regeneration of, of starting materials because it is cyclical. It has to go around in loops. So not only do you have the regular stages of the cycle, but you also have the steps of preparation, reshuffling, isomerization, phosphorylation, 
basically things that will help to regenerate starting material and let the, the cycle go through again. Okay, so I'm not going to make you memorize this. I just wanted to show you that it's a little more complicated than the previous slide may have made it seem. Okay, now, when we talk about photosynthesis and we're talking about the carbon dioxide fi fixation and how the plant is getting their, their ultimate nutrient at the end of this process, there are a few different pathways that can occur. Uh, I also like to scare students and make you think that I'm going to have you memorize everything you see in this area, but I am not going to have you do that. Uh, that's what Google is for. Um, <laughs> and so when we talk about carbon dioxide fixation, I want you to be aware that there are different pathways. Now, in the plants that you would find here in New York, uh, in a temperate type of environment, meaning that, you know, it's cool, it's warm, it's not, you know, anything crazy in terms of the temperature, uh, and, and high moisture, nice and moist environment. I'm sorry, I know students hate when I say moist, so I intentionally keep saying the word moist. Um, but anyway, in New York or a temperate type of environments, the plants that you would see here are called C3. If, however, you are looking at tropical plants, what tropical plants will use in hot, humid environments is called the C4 pathway. Okay, C4 pathway. And basically, with this pathway, if you picture plants, okay, using this pathway, you then picturing tropical plants, I'm sure you're visualizing the types of plants with massive, big, big green leaves or, or colorful leaves everywhere, very giant kind of foliage. And that's because with the C4 pathway, you end up having plants benefiting by growing much quicker and producing more biomass. And what's going on in terms of these plants is they have a higher rate of photosynthesis and a reduced rate of photorespiration. And what photorespiration is, is basically something that's very wasteful for plants. Um, it's when you end up having the, the enzyme uh, Rubisco oxygenating Ruby P and wasting some of the energy that would be produced in photosynthesis. And so basically in these kind of photorespiration events, you end up with the plants using up oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide, but they're not producing ATP or sugar, which is very wasteful. And if they're not producing the carbohydrate, they're not going to increase in biomass, meaning they're not going to get you know, the bigger leaves. So with C4 plants, since they reduce the rate of photorespiration, they're reducing the wastefulness. They're reducing the consumption of resources not resulting in carbohydrates, and they end up getting a much bigger biomass and maximizing their photosynthesis. The other type of pathway or that, that plants can use that I want to mention, in addition to the C3 pathway that our New York plants would use and the C4 pathway that big, beautiful tropical plants in a very, uh, very hot, uh, humid kind of environment would use, you also have CAM plants. And what I'd like you to do is underline the CA of CAM, and then underline the CA of cactus. So when you see CAM, think cactus, because the plants that will use CAM are desert succulent plants, okay? Plants that end up being in very dry environments and being able to survive in low levels of water. And the way they do that is because they have the highest water use efficiencies. They're doing well 
in, in environments that lack water because they're very good at maximizing and protecting the, the little water that they have. And they do this by capturing carbon dioxide at night and then fixing the carbon dioxide in the day. And the reason that they do that is so that they can keep their somata, the little pores on their, on their uh, leaves or on their structures, they can keep them closed during the day, okay? And not having that gas exchange during the day, you know, letting the, the carbon dioxide in during the day, by keeping those stomata closed, they're also reducing the water that would evaporate out or drip out of those pores if they were open during the hot time of the day, okay? So they end up maximizing water use and are great for plants in dry environments. So the cactus is the one I want you to remember for CAM. The last term I want you to remember is the glyoxylate cycle. And what I want you to think is anytime you're outside and you see a little sprout of a plant starting to pop out of the soil, I want you to say, oh, wow, look at that little guy. He did really, really good with his glyoxylate cycle. Okay, really impress your friends that way, walking down the street and say, hey, check out that glyoxylate cycle result when you see that, that sprout. Okay, as I say that, I'm realizing why I have so few friends. But anyway, uh, the glyoxylate cycle, you're mainly going to see that most active in seedlings. And basically what it is, is it's a way for plants to use fats that have been stored in seeds to be converted to sucrose, okay? So that tells you, if you picture a seed in the ground, all right, and it needs to make the, the carbohydrates, the sugars for, for biomass to, to grow, right? But it's under the soil. And what do you need for photosynthesis? You need light, right? We, we, we just went through the whole light reaction. You can't have that without sunlight. So a seed would not be able to have regular photosynthesis occurring. And so glyoxylate cycle gives it an alternative. It's a metabolic pathway for them to convert other molecules to serve as a carbon source for glucose biosynthesis and to, to make the glucose that they need to then sprout out of the ground. Okay, so please associate this cycle with seedlings and, and with seeds using this to use fats to convert to sucrose rather than doing the photosynthetic process that we talked about for the rest of this lecture. And that brings us to today's review questions. Again, please send these to me in the Remind app. And that is it for today. As always, if you have any questions, please contact me day or night. I always say I have no life, so feel free. You're not interrupting or disturbing me. Thank you and have a great day.